Hi, we're continuing our series on Luke's Gospel. We're going to jump straight in and read the scripture, which is from Luke chapter 15, verse 1 to 10, and then we'll pray. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10 then. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's pray, shall we? Gracious Lord God, we pray that you'd open Jesus' word up to us to understand it clearly. Uh, we pray that you would help us to follow you as we see who you are and how worthy you are of our love. In Jesus' name, Amen. Oh, my wife Sharon and I enjoy watching a TV series, The American Office. It's an old series, but it makes us laugh. And like the English version that came before it, one of the major themes running through the whole thing is a would-be office romance. Now, it would be if the two who are attracted to each other would ever get up the courage to speak to each other, but they don't at least for the first three series they don't because they're terrified that they'll tell each other how they feel and then they'll be rejected and that'll be it and that they'll lose the friendship that they have and it's painful to watch because we as the viewer know right from the start that they're really attracted to each other we know uh, that they're in love if only they pick up the courage if only they if only they tell each other how they felt but they don't, and so they tiptoe around, chatting to each other at every opportunity they get, spending lunches together, but never really opening up, never risking blowing the whole thing, and so it goes on. Well, in our passage this morning, the sinners and tax collectors are in much the same position. They've just heard Jesus' challenge that being a disciple means being willing to suffer, putting Jesus before family and friends, being willing to give up everything to follow him. And they're captivated by his words. This is something quite amazing going on. Something's, something's grabbed their attention and far from being pushed away, they press in. They want to hear what he has to say. And yet these are sinners and tax collectors. Surely they don't merit Jesus' attention. Now, they don't voice that, at least not in Luke's reporting of what happens. And in fact, perhaps it hasn't even occurred to them, but if not yet, it will soon, because there are the Pharisees and the tax collectors gathered round the crowd, and they're going to see to that. They stand round the edges of the crowd, muttering in verse 2, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They're pretty confident, the Pharisees, that they're in, but these guys in the crowd aren't. They're definitely out. So why is Jesus wasting his time on them? Here are the damned, the lost, those who are beyond hope, unlike the Pharisees. They've put themselves beyond the mercy of God, surely. Well, if the tax collectors and sinners were listening to the mutterings of the Pharisees on that day, they... They've pretty much given up hope, just as a hope, hopeful romantic gives up hope when his mates tell him that he's got no chance, that she's out of his league, that she's already got a boyfriend and it's the Pharisees. 
I wonder whether you've ever felt like that, whether you've ever felt like you've put yourself beyond God's help, beyond his care and attention, that his attention's already gone somewhere more valid, more worthwhile than it's being on you. Perhaps you haven't formulated it quite like that, but when you think of God, you feel like he's distant, hard to please, like you'd need to do an awful lot to find him and convince him that you're worth his time, his attention, his care. Perhaps you've looked around and seen super Christians, the guys who seem to have it all sorted. Trust me, they don't. But you find it a bit discouraging. And when you try to crowd in and listen to Jesus, you have the feeling there are a whole bunch of people that he must be more pleased with. People who deserve his attention more. People he'd be better off giving his attention to. You just have the feeling that if God has a list of people he's going to pay attention to, you're a long way down it on the D list or the E list at best. Perhaps, sadly, you've been in earshot of the Pharisees stood round the edge of the crowd. You've been hurt by people muttering or passing judgment or suggesting that you aren't as worthy of God's attention. Well, Christians get it wrong and sad, sadly we sometimes do fall into bad habits or hurtful mistakes. And when we do, we need to repent and ask God's forgiveness. And if I've ever been guilty of that, then I'd ask your forgiveness right now. But what I want us to do this morning is not to show you what the Pharisees think, but what Jesus thinks about you, to show you his heart, because it really couldn't be more different. So let's come back to our metaphor of somebody wondering whether the other loves them wondering but not quite sure, a bit anxious. Here is our prospective believer wondering if Jesus loves them. Or even a believer who's just struggling with assurance, with having confidence that Jesus still loves them, that they haven't messed it up. Wondering whether Jesus wants you, values you, sees you as a priority for his attention and care. Well, here in this passage is what Jesus has to say to you. And he says it in two parables. The first is of a sheep, a lost sheep, one of a hundred. This sheep starts out as part of a crowd. And yet as soon as they're missing, the shepherd knows and he sets out to find them. Notice that it isn't the sheep calling that causes the search. The shepherd is simply paying attention. That's how they know it's gone. And as soon as they realise they are off, searching, no question of whether this sheep is worth it, they are. And this shepherd searches and he searches and when he finds it, he carries it home. Here is a shepherd who values his sheep. Here is a shepherd who values you. Now this picture is about more than feeling a bit confused or anxious or just kind of wandering away. This is a picture of salvation and of being cut off from salvation and lost. The sheep that's wandered away is a sheep that's in trouble, at risk, a sheep that faces destruction by wild animals, just as the tax collectors and sinners and therefore us, without Christ, face destruction and death. But this sheep is gathered in, not because the sheep is especially wise, not because the sheep has a particularly fine coat or is a better sheep than the others. No, simply because it was lost and Jesus cares that it's lost and he comes to find it. Now to the tax collectors and the sinners, and to you and me and anyone lost, wondering if they might be found, Jesus says, I care about you. I care deeply about you and I am coming to rescue you. I will not give up on you. It doesn't matter how lost religion may say you are. It doesn't matter how far you feel you've strayed from God. I'm coming for you. I am coming for you. Jesus is the active party in this. And he will carry us home. And will there be a big telling off when the sheep gets back? Will we get rebuked for our sinfulness and waywardness? Well, look at what happens when the sheep arrives home. Excitement. 
so much excitement. The shepherd calls in his neighbours, he calls in his friends and he says, verse 4, uh, verse 6, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. You see, Jesus is not a grudging saviour. He isn't having his arm twisted. Heaven rejoices at each sinner saved. This is God's heart. This is how much Christ loves you. His heart for the crowd of sinners and tax collectors, his heart for us, his heart for the people filling the streets around us, the old builds and the new builds, the flats and the houses, the farms and the shops, the warehouses and the schools, wherever you are, for each and every person, Jesus' heart is that we would be found, truly found, that we would know his love. Now, of course, there will be some who hear that and think, well, I don't need to repent. I've earned my right place with God. I'll chat to him about the good I've done and we'll come to an arrangement. There will be those who feel that God owes them salvation because they're good enough. Well, heaven won't celebrate for you, says Jesus. It won't celebrate for 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. Of course, the reality is that those 99 people don't exist because none of us actually are truly good. None of us are without sin. We're all lost without Jesus. So, here the point that Jesus is making again. After all, imagine what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees that day. He's saying, look guys, if you've gone through life thinking that you've made it, that you've earned God's good favour, then it's a major step to admit that you haven't. It's a vulnerable thing. It means being honest with yourself and being honest with God, coming to him empty-handed, recognising that you don't deserve his love. And it would be understandable in that situation, as you, are, as you uh, humble yourself before God, it would be understandable if you wondered whether God would accept you at all. Like a hopeful romantic who's written the most amazing online profile saying they were completely awesome. A top CEO, captain of a top flight football team, owned your own Learjet. And then having to actually meet the person face to face, knowing that they were going to see straight through all the lies. That's a vulnerable thing to do. That's what Jesus is asking the Pharisees and any of us who've been in the habit of thinking that we are righteous before God from our, because of what we've done. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. And it would be understandable that we would wonder, well, if I do that, will Jesus reject me? Well, that's the point that Jesus is making again. Let me read verses 8 to 10. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner however convinced they were before that they'd saved themselves, over one sinner who repents. Brothers and sisters, no matter what your journey up to this point, let me encourage you to come to Jesus. His heart is for you, not against you. He has come to get you because he genuinely does care for you and he wants you to know his blessing and favour. He wants you to be the reason for the party in heaven. So it leaves simply that question. As Jesus has, has revealed his heart to you, so will you accept him? Brothers and sisters, this is the Jesus that we worship. This is the Jesus we are sharing with those around us to all who will hear. Let me encourage you then, now that you have heard Jesus' heart for you, if you have never placed your faith in him before, to do that today. 
it doesn't need to be complex words. It doesn't need to be clever rhetoric. Simply place your life in Jesus' hands. It can be as simple as praying to him, Lord Jesus, I want to be your disciple. And I recognize that my salvation comes from you and simply is by you, that you have done everything that is necessary for me to be restored to you. It's as simple as that. If, if you're not sure quite what to do, if you want to chat with us, get in contact with us through our church web, website, churchonthegreen.online. Uh, if you're a member of the congregation, just ring us up, have a chat with us, get in touch through the WhatsApp group. However it is, though, I'd encourage you to seek out a brother or sister in Christ, part of uh, part of our church, part of a good church near you, and uh, and just place your life in Jesus' hands. If you've been a believer for some time and you're wanting just to reaffirm, if you're feeling encouraged by Jesus' revelation, is revealing his heart for you, then praise God. Uh, we have every reason to be encouraged with how wonderful Jesus is. But we pray that God would bless you and that he'd help you to grow in your knowledge and your assurance of your faith this week. Uh, with that said, let's pray, shall we? Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you reveal yourself in your word, that Lord, when we are doubtful, when we wonder whether we have placed ourselves beyond your love, we can come back to this passage and others like it in the Bible that tell us that you so loved the world that you gave your only son to die for us, that we might have eternal life. Lord, uh, we see your heart and Lord, we rejoice in how great your heart is for your lost, for us. Lord, we thank you that when we place our faith in you, Lord, there is a party in heaven. And so we are, Lord, we are ready, knowing that we are loved, to set out to live for you in discipleship. Lord, we know that won't be without cost, but we thank you that we journey with you in our discipleship. So thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you this week.